Orientations, 11 Points, by Julius Evola is an essay that is featured in the book, A Handbook for Right-Wing Youth. The book is a collection of Evola's essays, which was compiled by Hungarian traditionalists and later published in English by Arctos Media. In Orientations, 11 Points, Julius Evola, who was writing in 1950, seeks to provide guidance on how young men on the right should proceed in the post-war era. Beginning with point one, Evola immediately hits the reader with a black pill, writing, There is no point in indulging wishful thinking with the illusion of any kind of optimism. Today, we find ourselves at the end of a cycle. Already for centuries, at first insensibly, then with the momentum of a landslide, Multiple processes have destroyed every normal and legitimate human order in the West, and falsified every higher conception of living, acting, knowing, and fighting. And the momentum of this fall, its velocity, its giddiness, has been called progress. The end of the cycle that he is referring to is the Kali Yuga, the great era of disaster and degeneration prophesied in Hindu mythology. Evola then recounts the events of the 1940s with magnificent eloquence, explaining how a liberal democracy and a constitutional monarchy allied themselves with red subversion to destroy Europe. As we all know, this alliance succeeded in the war, causing Europe's sons and daughters to find themselves among the ruins of a once great order. The primary question, then, according to Evola, is what can these individuals among the ruins do? This question transitions smoothly into point two of the essay. Evola is emphatic that our concern is primarily of a moral character. Writing in 1950, Evola observed that a climate of moral amnesia, the supremacy of the lowest interests, and living day by day characterized post-war man. Post-war Western man is oriented downwards towards materialist, shallow concerns, and away from anything of a higher, more meaningful nature. Additionally, Evola chastises those on the right who perceive our situation to be a purely political struggle. The defeat of the Axis brought about a new age in which Western man himself, not just his political systems, were degraded. Because the very spirit of Western man was changed for the worse, purely political solutions would not succeed in fixing the problem. According to Evola, there must be an internal revitalization of the spirit of men, if any meaningful change is to come about. Hence, Evola calls for those who find themselves among the ruins to become the new man, an archetype of person characterized by an internal fortitude, a determined spirit, and an iron adherence to principles. Evola elaborates on what defines the new man in point three. He specifically brings up the idea of the legionary spirit, an attitude that drives a person to choose the hardest of tasks and do them dutifully out of a sense of loyalty. Evola's new man will be steadfastly loyal to capital T tradition, he will be unwavering and will not compromise on his ideas, and his spirit will shine as a beacon for those around him. Moreover, the new man will fight for his ideas in all areas of life, even when he knows the battle is lost. So much like a Roman legionnaire, the iron discipline of the new man means he cannot abandon his duty to tradition no matter the circumstance. Such is the nature of the new man, to always persevere and never compromise one's duty. Point four adds to Evola's idea of the new man by clarifying that he holds contempt for bourgeois culture as well as for the collectivist, materialist culture of communist states. Against collectivism and materialism, Evola argues that these ideas are downward oriented and herald the mass man. They orient men away from the spiritual and the heroic and towards social entropy and egalitarianism. For these reasons, Evola condemns Marxism. However, he is also very clear that these same characteristics are present in bourgeois culture as well. He eviscerates bourgeois society as standardizing, conformist, decadent, and certain to orient men away from the spiritual and the heroic. Bourgeois society is antagonistic to tradition, its belief in hierarchy, its striving for spiritual transcendence, and its calls for heroism. As such, the Evolian new man supports neither the bourgeois culture of the West nor the collectivizing materialist culture of the Soviet Union. Point five is centered around the necessity of recognizing the chain of causes that led to modernity. Evola argues that what we recognize today as leftism 
came in stages with each building on the ideas of the previous stage. First came liberalism, which emerged from England and France during the Enlightenment. Then according to Evola came democracy, then socialism, then radicalism, and most recently, at the time of Evola's writing in 1950, communism. Each are strains of the same underlying sickness in the West. Furthermore, each strain undermines tradition and attacks every normal social ordering. Because of this, all are considered to be subversive by Julius Evola. Point 6 addresses a problem common to both capitalism and communism, the primacy of the economy in politics. Evola argues that economic concerns must always be subordinate in a society. What matters most is not materialistic craving for wealth, but instead, the moral and spiritual character of a society. Prioritization of economics has led to vapid consumerism, the rise of trade unions, and the decay of tradition and religion. The solution Evola offers is to orient away from economic growth as being the ultimate concern of politics. Doing so would rebuff consumerism, vapid materialism, and check the power of the trade unions. Moreover, it would allow for higher values to take its place. Point 7 addresses the topic of totalitarianism. Evola argues that hierarchy does not equal hierarchism, and that totalitarianism establishes a hierarchy in which is artificial and unnatural. Even if the state's imposed hierarchy does reflect the natural order, it won't necessarily stay this way due to the hierarchy's existence being predicated upon state power as opposed to organic excellence. Furthermore, totalitarian states in Evola's mind will drift away from adhering to higher spiritual principles and towards myopic doctrinal purity. Instead of a totalitarian government, Evola advocates for an aristocracy of great men, guided by spiritual principles and tradition, who will uphold a natural hierarchy and maintain order. Point 8 addresses the subject of nationalism, and is possibly the most contentious point in the essay. Evola was concerned with chauvinistic nationalism dividing Europe, and argued that nationalism must be subordinate to a higher spiritual idea. As Evola writes, our true fatherland must be recognized in the idea. What counts is not coming from the same land or speaking the same language, but sharing the same idea. By idea, Evola does not necessarily mean a specific ideology. Rather, he refers to a disposition towards heroic attitudes and tradition. To illustrate this point, consider that a right-wing pagan from Europe and a right-wing Christian from America have more in common with each other than they do with liberals from their own countries and their own ethnicities. They are both concerned with similar values which liberals are not. Needless to say, however, many rightists of a more nationalist variety might hold a different perspective to Evola's. Judgment pertaining to the merits of this point will be left up to the viewer to decide. Point 9 deals with four subversive ideas which Evola says must be identified and attacked. The first of these is Marxism, which has already been addressed in previous points. The other three ideas Evola mentions are Darwinism, Psychoanalysis, and Existentialism. It is worth quoting Evola on each. Regarding Darwinism, Evola writes, Against Darwinism, we must reclaim the fundamental dignity of the human person by recognizing its true place, which is not that of an individual, more or less evolved animal species among so many others, differentiated by natural selection, and always linked to bestial and primitivistic origins. Rather, it is one which can be elevated virtually beyond the biological level. The biologistic Darwinian myth, in one variant or another, has the precise value of dogma defended by the anathemas of science in the materialism of both Marxist and American civilization. Modern man has gotten used to this degraded conception, tranquilly recognizing himself in it, and finding it natural. Essentially, Evola's critique of Darwinism is that it causes people to see themselves akin to animals and undervalue their true worth. As such, Darwinism denigrates human dignity by reducing humans solely to the realm of the material and away from the realm of the spiritual. Regarding psychoanalysis, Evola writes, Against psychoanalysis, we should oppose the ideal of an ego which does not abdicate and which intends to remain conscious, autonomous, and sovereign in the face of the nocturnal and subterranean part of his soul and the demonic character of sexuality. 
Evola's main problem with psychoanalysis is that it strips away a sense of responsibility and agency from a person and convince them that they are defective and sick on an ontological level. It often harms rather than helps the people who seek it out, especially if the therapist is a subversive actor concerned most with his patient's sexuality. Regarding existentialism, Evola writes, As for existentialism, it is necessary to recognize in it the spiritual state of crisis that has become systematized and fawned upon, being the truth of a shattered and contradictory human type, which experiences a liberty by which it does not feel elevated as anguish, tragic fate, and absurdity. Such people feel rather condemned without escape and responsibility to this end in the midst of a world stripped of value and meaning. Essentially, existentialism romanticizes nihilism in a spirit draining. It orients men away from the higher spiritual and heroic values and causes immense psychological pain. Evola notes that this pain drives people to embrace false supports, which inevitably weaken them, such as resorting to drug use to escape one's problems. For these reasons, Darwinism, psychoanalysis, and existentialism ought to be opposed by the right, in addition to opposing Marxism. Point 10, much like point 4, addresses bourgeois society and the issues therein. Evola is critical of bourgeois morality on the grounds that it is vapid, petty, conformist, and risk-averse. Bourgeois people live too comfortably and will not break free of the hold that modernity has on them because they are distracted by bread and circuses. To be an Evolian new man means rejecting bourgeois society, and one cannot oppose bourgeois culture if one is living like bourgeois people. The antidote, then, is to reorient away from bourgeois norms and towards tradition. Only then will one develop the self and earn the distinction of the new man. Finally, point 11 deals with the topic of religion. Evola vehemently opposes a secular state and correctly identifies that any rightist movement must have a religious component. As Evola writes, a religious factor is necessary as a background for a truly heroic conception of life, such as must be essential for our group. It is necessary to feel the evidence in ourselves that beyond this earthly life, there is a higher life, because only someone who feels this way possesses a force that cannot be broken or overwhelmed. Importantly, Evola does not advocate a specific religion, but instead seems to advocate a form of spirituality not bound by any dogmatic formulations of any particular faith. This is often referred to as taking the left-hand path, but if someone finds that they are called to the right-hand path, also known as a conventional religion, Evola would be unlikely to object to their own judgment on which path is right for that person. What is most important is to have an animating spirit and vitality drawn from religion that will enable the new man to persevere as it did for the Roman legionaries, the Vikings, and the crusaders of old Europe.